We're, we're really encouraging folks to really be, um, to, to define current reality and to be honest with that and to, uh, to, to see if, if that, uh, once they have acknowledged who they are, where they are right now, uh, what the next step would be as they seek to make disciples of Christ. Hello, this is Pastor Terry Goodman, and I want to welcome you to the Wesleyan Connection. This podcast is primarily for the clergy and laity of the Holston Annual Conference. Join with me now as I take a look around the Connection and share some of the things happening in the churches of our annual conference. I want to welcome you to Monday Morning with the District Superintendent. This morning, uh, it's an interview or a conversation, if you want to look at it in those terms, that I had with my friend Tom Ballard. We go back uh, quite a few years. If I'm not mistaken, we probably went through local pastor's licensing school together or shortly thereafter our paths crossed, and uh, we've kept in touch on and off through the years. I'm trying to think if we've ever served in the same district or not. I think we've never managed that. But uh, you know how those things go. You keep the friendships alive. You touch base every now and then. And so I really enjoyed the opportunity to sit down with Tom and talk with him about the things that are happening in the Morristown District. And I hope you will find it an illuminating conversation as we uh, discuss how to make disciples for Jesus Christ. I'm here talking this morning with uh, Tom Ballard, he is the district superintendent in the Morristown district, and I'm going to ask him similar questions that I've been asking the other district superintendents. I want to start with, what is the, uh, the, the theme that sort of resonates in the Morristown district in terms of how do you as a district seek to make disciples for Jesus Christ? Well, as we look at our um, as we look at our local churches we I mean we're really convinced that that the uh, mission of the church as described in the discipline is to make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world but we also realize that we do that within specific contexts and in the Morristown district uh, I have um, identified kind of in a broad stroke that uh, we are uh, we're comprised of, of churches in three different areas, not geographic areas necessarily, but uh, small towns and uh, rural and uh, mountain churches. And uh, we are, uh, through those local churches, we're uh, trying to develop resources within the, the district uh, one of the one of the most recent resources that we have tapped into is uh, a, a consulting uh, path uh, called Next Steps Ministry Now, where we have identified through Mission Insight data and also through uh, some subjective. Uh, uh, a, a subjective piece on my part, uh, churches that we believe are poised to really make an impact in their respective communities. Uh, right now we've got five of those churches signed on and uh, they're going through a process that's not a cookie cutter process, but it's a, a process where they're really looking at themselves, they're looking at their own history and uh, identifying what is it in those local churches that have brought them to where they are at uh, to this particular point in time and not trying to, to change uh, uh, to, to, to change what they have been but to become more of what they have been uh, in a uh, in a in the context of of today and what their challenges are today so um, that's that's part of what we're doing. We're we're really encouraging folks to really be um, 
to, to define current reality and to be honest with that and to, uh, to, to see if, if that, uh, once they have acknowledged who they are, where they are right now, uh, what the next step would be as they seek to make disciples of Christ. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot with this one, but it's the question is going to be, can you give me some specific examples? And I know that there, you'd want to say something about every church in your district, and that we just don't have time for that. And I'm sure that there's some great stories that I can delve into with later podcasts. But, but for now, it seems like you're saying that you're, you're challenging some of your churches to be very specific and examine themselves. Has anything come from that? Is there, are there ministries that are burgeoning or ministries that are ongoing that are just making a, a difference? Well, in our Next Steps ministry process, we're still so early in that that uh, that our churches that are involved with that are still in that uh, identification stage, I guess you would say. But uh, but we do have some examples of churches that are uh, that are uh, asking the tough questions. Uh, what are next steps for us? For example, we have uh, one of our small membership uh, rural churches in Jefferson County that uh, for quite some time now has uh, had a, a weekly entree into the uh, Jefferson County Jail, and particularly the, the women's pod, because the, the, the pastor of this particular church is female, has a heart for uh, reaching out to uh, women who are incarcerated, and over a period of time has been able to, uh, to, to see some fruit from that. Uh, some of those ladies, once they have been released, have uh, found themselves in the pew and have, uh, have felt uh, welcome there. We have one of our small town churches um, in Newport that uh, started uh, looking at a recovery ministry because there was no real... Um, recovery ministry of any substance in the area and uh, even though that has not launched yet uh, it looks like that within the next few months that it is going to launch and be an outreach to those persons that are struggling with uh, addictive uh, behavior Um, and one other I will mention a small town uh, in downtown Morristown, uh, this is the second winter that uh, they have engaged in what they just simply call a fence ministry, F-E-N-C-E, because around their playground there is a chain link fence and uh, they uh, gather uh, new uh, winter clothing, particularly uh, scarves, toboggans, gloves, and put those in a a baggie, something that is sealed, and hang it on the the fence and uh, and, uh, attempt to get word out that if uh, if you're cold, if you're homeless, or if you cannot afford uh, a winter clothing item, then check out our fence. And, uh, and you're welcome to, to take at no charge uh, the items that are hanging on the fence. Wow. That is a unique way to do ministry. Just the, the trust factor alone that somebody's just not going to come along and take everything. Right. To, to believe that just the right persons are going to get there. That sounds like a terrific ministry. Uh, you are an elder in the church. And as an elder in the church, you are not currently serving a local church, but you're in a ministry that has an overseer's sort of viewpoint of what uh, is happening in the churches. What was the transition like for you from a local pastor to a district superintendent? What maybe surprised you or what did you see for the first time that maybe you had not recognized when you were in the local church? Well, uh, certainly a, a steep uh, learning curve, no question about that. Uh, 
the the whole area of of uh, trying to meet pastors and meet churches right where they were and not uh, not forcing them to see things that that I might see because they have been so maybe so close to their own context whereas I'm coming in brand new and you might say I have a I have a balcony view and they have the dance floor view and so part of that challenge has has been simply to uh, figure out ways to invite them to have a dance floor view um, an example of that would be to, um, and I have I have said this to uh, our clergy, and I've said this to uh, lay leadership as well, particularly pastor parish or staff parish relations committees, and that is that um, when it comes to making uh, appointments, that we we do our very best to try to match. Uh, a church or a group of churches with a a particular pastor, but uh, it's not as if we have um, a pool of pastors to draw from, and uh, we have a certain pool to draw from, but at the same time, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to help our committees understand that uh, they are part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, so it's been a matter of trying to strengthen the connection and to remind folks that they indeed are, uh, are connected to other local churches, they're connected to the district, they're connected to the annual conference, they're, they're connected to our Wesley Foundations, they're connected to our mission endeavors like Jubilee Project, and, and there's really strength in that, and, and, and to celebrate that, and also to, uh, to, to understand that, that uh, you know, their ministry is within a particular context, but they really do need to look beyond that context. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the exciting things has, has been to see the number of churches that are partnering with schools. Um, but just in terms of, of the learning curve for me and that transition, it, uh, it has been really humbling to, uh, to, to see uh, churches in specific contexts and to, and to help them to understand that their, uh, their future isn't really dependent upon what the, the church down the road is doing. Their future is dependent upon their own capacity to grow into who God wants them to be. And so rather than comparing themselves with some other church, uh, I've encouraged them to compare themselves to what their own capacity is and then to grow into that capacity. Sounds very uh, like a good approach uh, to help them understand where they're at and what they can become. Two final questions. Okay. First one is, what is the passion that drives you to be in ministry? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is that uh, every morning when I rise, I have to make a decision that 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 day is going to be a day that I am again going to invest myself in God's calling upon my life. So uh, that that passion, it would indeed be rooted in uh, a calling, I believe a divine calling. And, uh, and I, in some ways, uh, I, I, I really do believe that the, the hope of, of our world is not rooted in a particular political system. It's, it's not 
rooted in uh, in uh, making sure that that uh, uh, our you know, bank accounts are healthy. Uh, our 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 passion, my passion, is uh, is to uh, is to convince folks as best I can uh, where they are right now that the the real hope of this world is found in Jesus Christ, and and that there's nothing else that compares to that hope and and for for me and I, I I believe for for many of my colleagues who are um, who are part of the baby boomer generation uh, I believe we have come to realize that there are things that are that that uh, we thought were important that aren't as important for us uh, today and we have uh, we have reoriented our uh, our priorities, and um, and so I, you know, I, I struggle for some words there, but it's a heart thing. It's uh, it's uh, it's certainly the I believe the Holy Spirit at work in my life that continues to to push and pull and nudge and correct. That um, that is a is is a real uh, real force in my life. Final question. This is the most profound theological question that I believe I can ask of any person. What is your favorite dessert? <laughs> well, there's no. I don't have to. I don't have to vote on that one. It would be a, a good slice of peanut butter pie. Peanut butter pie, that creamy kind with a graham cracker crust. Uh, graham cracker crust and maybe a hint of chocolate on top, but that's not a requirement because there's some peanut butter pie that has so much chocolate that you can't taste the peanut butter. <laughs> My wife says, well, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, Tom, I want to thank you for sharing with us this morning, and I'll be praying for your ministry and for the churches of your district. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> This is Pastor Goodman. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Wesleyan Connection. Be sure to check back often for more podcasts.